Welcome back to Fight Capital, where we step into the ring of combat sports business. I'm your host, Ryan Rappaport. Today, I'm stoked to introduce Olympian and two-time Irish boxing champion Emmett Brennan. I love his story of triumph, working hard to make his Olympic aspirations come true. Now, after a two-year hiatus and having weathered a COVID, uh, a COVID postponed Olympic tournament, he's making a triumphant return to the ring for his pro debut on July 1st in Belfast at Close Encounters event put on by MHD Productions. Thanks for taking time away from training today, Emmett. How are you and where are you joining from? Uh, I'm joining from Dublin, so that's where I'm based out of Dublin, Ireland. Um, and yeah, everything's going great. So we're nine days out from, from fight night. I haven't fought in two years, so it's not everything. Everything doesn't feel new again, but it's um, it's been a long time since I had a fight camp, since I had to watch me weight, bring the weight down. I'm actually fighting at a lower weight now than what I fought at in the Olympics. So it's um, it's not new, but it's an experience that I haven't had in the last two years. And for me, it's, uh, it's a great experience. It's great to finally get back to doing what I love. I've had two years out post-Olympics with shoulder injury and just trying to get the right management team behind me to go into the pro game. You know yourself. Um, it's a business. It's a doggy dog business. You need the right team behind you. You need people that you trust. And I wasn't really prepared to go into the professional game until I had the people that I trusted behind me. Now I have that. It's took a little bit longer than what I expected, but um, I'm very, very excited to get the show on the road. Yeah, well, you had a, a little bit of a different start than most people. Uh, you worked your way, you started really getting back into boxing at 25, right, and worked your way into the Olympics. Can you tell me a little bit about what contributed to the late start and that passion for getting the Olympics and that long journey there? Yeah, so I've boxed all my life. I've boxed since I was 10, but then once I got to like my early 20s, like a lot of people, I suppose in America, they have college or they're going to work. Um, you're just at an age where you start, you have to start earning a living. You start have to start bringing money in, standing on your own two feet. So I sort of went away from the sport of boxing. Um, something that I, I intensely done, I just gradually went away from the sport. And then I got to roughly around age 23 where, like age 21 to 23, I was still sort of stepping my feet into the ring here and there. I was training, I was doing little bits and then, I got to 23 and I was working as a plumber at the time um, it was just it was just too hard to juggle everything and try to get the boxing on top of it. On top of that, I wasn't really doing well, if I'm completely frank and honest, I wasn't doing well with boxing and um, my performances were dropping, I was losing a little bit of love for the sport and I went away completely from the sport roughly for about 18 months. In that 18 months I became very, very unhappy. A lot of things in my personal life weren't going right. And I just went, when I got to the age 25, I was like, oh, I am really unhappy in life. Um, I was like, what makes me happy? Boxing is what made me happy, but I'm, I'm 25, I'm in my mid-20s. It's very, very hard to go back. And if you are going back, you got to be all in. you got to go completely flat to the mat to try to get to the top. At this stage, I'd never really wasn't one of the top amateurs in Ireland so to have the dream of going to the Olympics was really one it was fascinating two it was scary but three it was kind of unrealistic from the outside point of view like for me it wasn't unrealistic but for other people looking in they would have been saying, would have been saying there's no chance sure he's not even he's not even at the top end of the boxers in his own country never let alone in the world but for me, I just I just set out on a journey. It was like a journey of self-discovery to see how far I could push my body and how far I could push my mind. And I knew it was going to be very, very hard. I, I, no, I wasn't naive and I didn't think it was going to be an easy journey. It was There was a lot of downs on the journey. Obviously, there's the highs of getting to the Olympics and the highs of winning national titles and fighting for your country and how proud that makes your family, your friends, yourself. It was great, but there was there were so many downs on that journey. You know yourself from boxing. Everyone only sees the peaks, they only see the highs. But for me it was just a it was a journey of self discovery. I really discovered who I was as a person. I'm a meant I meant me a very strong person and I needed that along the last four or five years to get to the Olympic Games. 
Well, I read how supportive your family had been contributing to this hard work that you were putting. I mean, you were, from what I understand, you were working a full-time job, uh, going to university and preparing for all of this, right? Over the course of time. Um, can you tell me a little bit about what that support from your family and network has meant for your career and where you're at now? Yeah, like without, without the family support and friend support, there is no real career because as you said, I was studying, I was in college at the time, university, it was online. So it was, it sort of, it helped me that it was online. I could study in my downtime, which is great, but you still got assignments and stuff like that on top of it. And it's, it's very, very stressful because you got deadlines on top of your own training. Then I was working in a gym. I was working roughly 20 to 30 hours on top of being a full-time athlete and a, a college student. So, Without the family support, especially, it's impossible. Now, I know in America, a lot of people, they move out of home at like 18. In Ireland, there's a housing crisis where, like I'm 32 now, when I was qualifying for the Olympics, I was like 27, 28, 29, 30. And a lot of people that age in Ireland are still living at home because the prices of houses in Ireland has gone insane. Um, the salary in Ireland at the moment isn't that high. So a lot of people my age are still live, living at home. And I had I had no other choice but to live at home with my parents and my family while I was going after the Olympics because financially it wasn't um, it wasn't actually possible to go after that dream if I moved out of home. So I was living at home. That was one big support. Then you have the likes of your mother doing the cooking at home, making sure everything is in order. These small little things that I genuinely, I did not have the time for because my time was consumed with training, work and college. After that was just sleep and rest. And it was like Groundhog Day. That was every single day. So I done my training Monday to Saturday. I worked Friday, Saturday, Sunday and Monday when I wasn't doing the training. And then I done all my college work on top of that. So without that family support and that network of people actually taking a little bit out of their life to make things easier for you, it, it would not be impossible. There's no way. Yeah, it's a great point. I mean, that's a thing in the U.S. here too, the, those commercial realities and challenges that athletes at an amateur level, which is what they call Olympic athletes, which there's nothing mm. amateur about no. getting to the Olympics, which has always bothered me. And we've seen that changing in this whole thing called uh, NIL name, image and likeness. So that's good. But I know a lot of Olympic athletes are faced with that ability to be able to support themselves while they're cha changing or start training to achieve their dreams. And, you know, there's just, can you tell me a little bit about what you face going to the Olympics and even, I guess, when transitioning post Olympics to professional sports, what that's looked like? Yeah, so like as you said, the biggest strain is probably finance, financial strain. Um, yeah, and age, as I said, twenty seven to thirty years of age, you should be bringing in a good salary. You're near enough, near enough coming to the peak of your working career. Like you, you should have been in a job for like the last seven or eight years. You're getting, you're walking up the ladder. I sacrificed all that for the Olympics. I, I left my job, leaving your job, you're leaving security the security of having an income coming in every week. Um, I wasn't actually on funding. I wasn't a funded athlete with the Irish team. So it meant like some athletes do get on funding where they get um, they get grants and sponsorship off the Irish government. I wasn't on that because I just wasn't meeting the criteria. And that's all well and good, but I had to make up finances from somewhere. So I had to work part-time. So the financially the stress was, it was... Yeah, it was horrible because as well, they're at the age where your friends are buying houses and they're starting families and they're doing all the things that a person in their late 20s should be doing and that's another sacrifice I had to make. You're looking at your friends moving on with their lives and you're still stuck living with your parents. It's it's stressful, but it's also emotionally stressful that you're not where you should be in life. But I always say these small little sacrifices because that's what they are in, in the end. Everyone... Everyone's running their own course in life. Um, what's good for me isn't good for you, and it's not good for the next person. We're all different. So I had to make these small sacrifices of living at home, 
not having a lot of money in the bank, not seeing my friends on the weekend, not going clubbing, not um, not doing the the stuff that everyone my age is doing. But um, ultimately, them small sacrifices is what gets you into the little percentage of elite athletes that go to the Olympics. Um, like my friends have their houses and their families, and I can go back and do that now. I'm in my thirties, but get to the Olympics because. They sacrifice their sport and career for for family life, and again, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, we're all on a different path in life. I suppose the transition now from professional from amateur boxing to professional boxing is professional boxing is about making money. It's a business, um, and I'm well aware of that. That's the pros and cons of being uh, 32 going into the professional game. I'm not naive. I have a better head on my shoulders rather than if I was 22. I would have just thinking you're going into this game and people are going to throw money at you. I oh, know that's not the way it is. You got to market yourself correctly. You got to go out and get the sponsorship yourself. You got to be the kind of person that the company or organization want to back and want to sponsor because one, there's a bit of worth in sponsoring you, and two, you're a good person and you offer something to your community. It's a lot easier to sponsor an athlete if they're likable. So that's something that I'm well aware of um, going into my thirties, And this is a business. Um, starting off on my first four or five fights, I'm not going to make a lot of money, and I know that. But the, the goal for me is from, from fight five onwards, I'm starting to make money that is going to make up for all the financial strain over the last um, four or five years. Yeah. And, and, you know, that post Olympic time, right. That's gotta be such a stressful time because you're coming off that high. I uh, had a chance to watch your pretty emotional interview after your Olympic competition. That was just really raw. And I appreciate people putting themselves out like that. You know, one of the things I also heard you talk about is the importance of like post competition, psychological support for athletes who are kind of like, okay, this is over you know, that next goal thing you're trying to achieve might not be for another year and you're coming off probably being pretty broke, broke even if you won, right? So can, mm. can you talk a little bit about that experience for you and what that's looked like as you kind of move forward and we're growing after that Olympic time? Yeah, like, so for me, there wasn't really much of a support network um, coming home from the Olympics. And that's something that maybe um, Team Oral can look at going forward. I, I didn't feel there was anyway. Maybe there was, and I just wasn't looking hard enough, for wherever it may be. But there, it's known after the Olympics, like, I think it's like 70 or 80% of athletes go into some sort of post-Olympic slump, um, some leading to mental health disorders. And yeah, it's just, you're on such a high, and you had this big goal for the last four years, 10 years, 20 years, no matter how long it may be. And then you finally get there and one day it's just over. You're like, what's next? For me, we talked about the sacrifices I made financially and, and personally and socially and everything I've done to get to the Olympics. I got injured before the Olympics. So my whole goal, my whole my life dream was to get to the Olympic Games. But once you get there, you want to reap the rewards. You want the big professional contract after. You want the sponsorship. You want to financially make up for the money that you've lost. I came back. I was injured. Um, I had a really bad shoulder injury. That meant I couldn't really go out and look for a professional contract because I didn't know if I would ever box again. That also meant I couldn't get the sponsorship opportunities on top of that because no one's going to sponsor you unless you can fight again because you're not worth anything to a company. So I was in a position where I worked so hard. I've dedicated my whole life to get here just over and there's literally I could not see anything in front of me I went over to America I went to New York to try to get a professional contract done some great networking over there I met some really really good people everything was really set in stone to get going move to New York get the whole Irish New York crowd behind me like we were, we were doing some really great work behind the scenes but on top of this the show that still was not getting better and we're talking roughly now seven, eight months post Olympics. I'm thirty, going thirty one. The clock is ticking. There's a lot of things going against me, and I just ended. I can remember I, I went off to New York for ten weeks. I drank myself silly alcohol, just drank for ten weeks because I was like, 
I'm at to give my whole life away to this sport and this is how it's going to end. Now look, I have to hold my hands high and be accountable because I was the one that made that decision. No one was making me drink, but I, I needed some sort of help. Lucky enough, I talked later on, I'm mentally very strong. I realised that I was going down the wrong road. I made the decision um, that I wasn't going to drink again. I came back to Ireland, got my head straight, really worked on myself, got my body back in great condition. The shoulder's in great condition now. Um, so it's been it's been a hell of a journey since the Olympics. And I've been finding a lot out about myself. And But going back to where we were post-Olympics, maybe if there was that support group there, wouldn't have happened in post Olympics. I wouldn't have gone into that down with spiral. Who knows? But it should at least be there, and it should maybe be a little bit more enforced on people coming back from the Olympics because it's known that there's um there's post Olympics depression and post Olympics mental health problems. Yeah, and as someone, I I stopped drinking seven months ago, and I've just felt so good, you know. And whether or not you're like an addict or you know it's ruining your life there is like a quality of living that you don't really see the other side of when, when you're not sober. Right. And so mine wasn't, mine was just for the heck of it. And I've just felt so good. Just didn't doing it for a month. I'm like, I'm going to keep it going. So I, I totally align with that. And I know how much better I feel, not just physically, but mentally after doing that. And I can only guess for you too. I mean, finding this new team, working with MHD productions, uh, can you tell me a little bit about your relationship with that group and who you're training with these days? Yeah, so it's it's actually it's MHD Promotions, I think. MHD Promotions, sorry, MHD yeah, Promotions. So, sorry so this that. this is just a one-off fight with them. They're not actually my promoters. I have a great management team. Very, very lucky again. So as I said earlier, I wasn't going to go into the professional game unless I had the right management team behind me, people that I trusted. I've been very fortunate. I've got Darren Barker a former world champion, and Joe Calzaghi, former undisputed world champion. So they, them two guys, they have OSG management, and they're going to be managing me going forward. Couldn't really ask for two better men in the boxing game to be looking after me prayer and direct me in the right, uh, right direction. But they can only direct me in the right direction, and they can only try to get me chances. I have to do the business in the ring. If I'm not winning, I'm not performing well, I'm not building my profile outside of the ring. I'm not putting myself in the best opportunity for these lads to go get me chances. Then it doesn't matter who you have direct in your career. I still got to do the work in the ring. I got to do the work when I'm training. I got to be fully focused outside of training. And this is where not drinking comes into it. I'm 32. I don't really have any more opportunities to miss. Everything for me in my career has to go near enough perfect. Imagine that putting hangovers and you're out drinking until 2, 3, 4 o'clock in the morning. That's just wasted energy that could be going into my career. I have no doubt if I was still drinking, I wouldn't be in the position that I am now. And my career wouldn't be a success because it's just wasted time. It's wasted energy. Like, I am in the peak of my career now. Why would I waste another few years drinking? I have the rest of my life to drink if I really want to go and do that. For the next five years, it makes no sense to drink. So, yeah, um, i got a great team behind me, but it means nothing unless I'm doing the walk in the background. And that's so true. And I know that they say a lot of times that combat sports are a young man game, but there are a lot of people proving that post-30s, there is a lot to be done, and that's usually when people are hitting their prime. And I know that you're preparing for this fight. Was it nine days now? Nine days out, yeah, nine yeah. days. So what do you see as that path toward getting more and more high-profile events on the, the regional and national scene as you keep working your way up? Yeah, so the force fight, as ev everyone's force fight, and I've been out of the ring for two years, we're going to be fighting a junior man. I, did, I didn't really want that, but this is where having a good team behind it, they were like, no, you've been out of the ring for two years. There's no point in going in and fighting a good guy. Why would you risk it? Makes no sense. Get your debut out of the way look great, get a good win, and then move on. We can look at good guys in two or three fights. So I'm not sure if you really know the infrastructure of Irish boxing. It's it's grown at the moment on the professional side. Ireland has been known for amateur boxing, and that's all really. But it's starting to build up a professional uh, profile. 
there's more and more people turning over. I'm very, very lucky because I'm fighting a super middleweight and there's, like Ireland's a small country, there's maybe seven or eight guys in my weight at super middleweight, which is great because there's a big pool of guys to fight each other. Um, in my head, I'm very, very confident that I'm top of that pile and I'm the best out of everyone. So I want to get this, get the debut out of the way. Then we're looking at August to try to get another fight against an Irish guy, so I won the Super Middleweights. If we could get that in my hometown of Dublin, that would be brilliant. If we have to travel, we have to travel. Yeah, well, I feel like the European boxing scene is on the up and up and everything that Eddie Hearn and Matchroom are doing. I feel like there's just this kind of, not renaissance, but there's some continued interest in the sport and where other things like MMA have kind of been, you know, you got Connor, you got Ian Gary. I mean, you're competing for a lot of uh, television time there, but I think that's carrying boxing along with it and seeing, you know, the team that you're working with now and the potential there, it's pretty exciting. And uh, it sounds like you got some amazing things coming forward here. Are there uh, any sponsors or people that you'd like to shout out for support? Yeah, so I've got, again, like I've, well, because I'm only going into the professional game, like the push for this fight, it's going to be really, really low. It's not going to be something that you're going to live off. So without sponsors, you are you're sort of not really making anything. So at the moment, I've got Robus Lighting. They've sponsored me. They've sponsored me since the Olympics, and they've been great to me. I've got Alpha Mechanical, again, another great company that my brother actually worked for. They've come, come on and jumped on as a sponsor. Again, without these, it's very, very hard for me to train. Then I've got Novum Engineering that have jumped on as well. So, them three sponsors, um, sorry, Novum Refrigeration, them three sponsors, um, without them, I would actually be losing money on this fight. So, I'm very, very lucky to have these backing me going into the fight. As I said, without them, um, I wouldn't have the fight because I'd be losing money. And then the last company that has sponsored me is my own company. It's called Fighter, F-I-G-H-T-R. It's, um, it's a boxing company for over 18s in Ireland. Because there's a, in Ireland, you really want to take kids in from 11 and 12 that want to compete. So we've seen there's a little bit of a gap in the market and we take in over 18s. Um, they don't actually go into national competition. We just teach them all the basics of boxing, the fundamentals, the fitness part, the dedication, all the hard work that goes into boxing, but they don't actually fight. So sort of like white collar boxing in America, it'd be very, very similar to that. So that's my company, Fight R Dublin. And um, they've come on and they bought me shorts. So um, I'm very, very happy with that. And as I said, without these sponsors, you know yourself, there's no, um, no boxing rep sponsors because the actual purses in in professional boxing, especially at the lower level, it's not very high. People can't live off. So, um, big up to anyone that sponsors um, an athlete, whether it's in boxing, MMA, or basketball, or whatever it is, you're you're actually helping these athletes make their dreams come true. So, um, yeah, without sponsors, it's not possible. You know, how, how can the people listening and people who are going to be reading the newsletter support you as you kind of move forward here in the career and start taking on even bigger and bigger challenges? Yeah, yeah. So, like, especially in Ireland, like, you get paid by the tickets that you sell. Um, if anyone wants to support you, it's about buying tickets. It's about backing you, following you, telling your friends about them. If you're at the fight, tagging the fighter in your, fo- in your photos or your, your posts, um, I'm very, very lucky that I sold all my tickets for the first fight. Brilliant. Like, now, saying that, I only got 120 tickets, but they were sold within 30 minutes, which is great. I would have liked and doubled that tickets even more. Because um, you're letting people down because I only got 120 tickets. You can't give them to everyone. But I'm in a very, very fortunate situation because some people can't sell tickets. It's very, very hard to get rid of tickets, you know, yourself in this game. So... I was blessed that the tickets are gone in a half an hour, so I already got some really good people to support me. Um, I suppose on your side of the pond in America, I am hoping to eventually switch to New York. Um, I'm not going to stay in Dublin full time. As I said, uh, the pro game in Dublin, it's not great at the moment. It is getting better, but 
in the next few months on events, you're going to have to make the switch to either London or New York. Um, my heart says New York. I've been there for two months. I know the last time I was there, I was drinking a lot. This time I don't drink. There's a great Irish community in New York, and the Irish back, back their own. They get behind their own. They support their own. So I think if I went to New York, I would do a crazy amount of ticket sales because you're constantly around the Irish community over there. So if there's any of the Irish community listening in New York, um, keep an eye out for me. Hopefully, maybe the start of 2024, I'll, I'll move to New York and base myself out there. But before I go to New York, I want to win the Celtic title and the Irish title. I don't want to go over there without them because, again, you're talking about pro profile and being marketable. There's so many Irish people in New York. It'd be great if I went over there with an Irish title and um, and a Celtic title. And I think there's one, there's like an Irish-American guy um, that's a super middleweight that lives in New York. So maybe me and him could fight. That would be great. Uh, if I forget his name. He's like six or seven and all, but he's, he's in the super middleweights. So imagine I came over with the Irish title. He would actually be eligible to fight for that, even though he's American, because he has the Irish parents or grandparents. Mm. So you could even fight him for the Irish title in New York. That would be unbelievable. Um, there's small little dreams that I have in my head, but I want to fight in New York. I want to fight out of there. As I said, I know so many people over there. The Irish, they're unbelievable, the Irish over there. Even the last time I went over, they couldn't support me enough. They couldn't try to help me out enough. And it's when you're that far away from home, it's great to have these people looking out for you. So, yeah, I want to get back over there. It's a great city full of great people. And for me to have my professional career out there would be unbelievable. Yeah, I think uh, I lived in New York for four years. And they're, like you said, very strong Irish community, very passionate Irish community as well and uh spend a fair share of time in pubs with them as well so yeah. i know that you'll be uh heavily supported and i love that you're speaking your path you know not a lot mm. of people are willing to actually say what they want to do put it out there knowing that hey now i have to kind of live up to that i'm going to put in the work to do that and so I, I love that you're doing that and i really appreciate you taking the time and this is awesome having these conversations mm. and hearing about your path to where you're at now and I'm really looking forward to seeing where your future goes and thank you again for doing this yeah not a problem i'm there talking about the path like when i talked about going to the olympics at age 25 after never even winning an Irish elite title people thought it was insane no one believed that i was going to be an olympian and um, but i do believe once you it's not like the the what's, what's i forget the word for but it's once you put it out there it gives you accountability now you got to work on it. Are you just going to talk the talk? Are you going to walk the walk? Um, if you put it out there to the world, you got to you got to put the groundwork in. you got to really believe in it. And I really believe in the path that I'm going on. It's not just words. I, I, I believe in what I'm saying. I put the work in. I have the proof behind that because I knew you can just say words, but that's not going to help it come true. Um, but once you're following that path, you're following the process, you're doing the groundwork, you're giving yourself the best chance and the best opportunity for these dreams to come true. And if they don't come true, so be it. You give it your best chance. You, you won't look back in 10 years and say, oh, I wish I could have done this. I wish I tried that. You live with no regrets. You have peace of mind that you went after something. And that's something that a lot of people don't do. They go for their average job and they settle for ordinary. But... Um, that's something I'm not willing to do. I want to go after my dreams and give it 100%. And if I get there, I get there. If I don't, I'll still be on the path that I'm supposed to be. Oh, but that's uh, I just the whole entire time. I, I believe that uh, because the whole entire time you've been talking, I've had goosebumps. You know, everything's been like standing mm. up on end. And uh, I, I feel that not only do you believe that, but you just have the uh, the foresight to know, hey, even if I don't achieve everything, I will never know unless I do it, unless I put in that work, unless I put myself out there. So kudos to you. We're going to be rooting for you on July 1st and looking forward to following you along this path and getting more people out there knowing who you are, following that journey as well. And just thanks for being here today. No problem. Thanks very much, Ryan. Appreciate you having me on. Yeah, cheers, Emmett.